Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. What a delight it is to be here tonight in this great congregation of preachers. I like them, number one, because they're independent Baptist preachers. And I like that word, south-wide. You can't make the south too wide for me. <laughs> and I'm delighted to be here and hear all this wonderful, beautiful music and singing tonight by this great choir, by Larry Hess and his friend who sung Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. It seems the great songs, most of them were written years and years ago, back during the days of great revivals. Not too many being written today. I'm not saying any, but not too many. And the old men seemed to know the doctrine of the Bible very, very well, and to write, and doctrine would come through. Mrs. Rice said to me one time, people learn more doctrine from singing than they do from preaching and teaching. I think she's right. But she was the words of that song, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's incorruptible blood. It's indispensable blood. It's in divisive blood. It's still as fresh right now in heaven as it was when it flowed from Jesus' veins. Federal men said it dried up in the dust of the earth. I wrote back and said, how, how can you believe Psalm 1610 and say such a thing? But he said, Thou will not suffer thy holy one to see corruption, neither would thou leave his soul in hell. How can you believe that his body and bones and skin and the rest of the organs are not corruptible, but his blood did corrupt? The blood is part of the body. It's incorruptible, too. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. I love those old songs. And what a joy to be with you, with this great, great fellowship. And what a great welcome you gave me tonight, and I'm very honored for that. I'm a little weak. I drove today. I didn't drive. I was driven here on a big, nice bus. Thanks to John Stansel and some friends. And uh, several asked, are you going to Southwide? I said, yeah, I'm alive. I'm going to Southwide. If I can, if I can get on a bus, I'm going to Southwide. <clears throat> My wife said, don't you feel more like staying at home? I really don't. I'd rather be in a congregation like this for about three hours and be at home for two weeks. I mean, you, you give life to people. I was in the hospital for 11 days. My first really extended hospital stay, I only one, one time for a little growth on my finger to have it removed. After being there for 11 days, I came home. On Monday night when I went in, the doctor said to my son, your daddy may not live through the night. But I did make it through that night, and another night, and another night. And now over a month, and I'm still here. He's been trying to bury me for three years now, that doctor. Went to see him three years ago. He said, you should live maybe six months. It's been two years and seven or eight months I'm still living. He said to me, you should have been dead two years ago. I'm still living. I may die tonight, but it won't be because he said it was. It's because God decided it's time to go. I feel like if he gets to hold me one more time, I will be gone. He'd like to kill me this time. After 11 days, I came home. I was radiation in my back, could hardly walk, and I saw the limp onto the porch, and my daughters had been there. Two of them are here tonight. The other was in Texas and would be here, but she is expecting a baby any day now and couldn't leave to be with us tonight. But they've been at our home and had cleaned the house up beautifully. Everything was immaculate. I have a big back porch, all glass stand with the thermal panes. It's really my office now. It has been for two and a half years. I came home. I walked onto the porch, and there's beautiful flowers that folks had sent, and green plants. And I, I found myself crying. I'm crying more than I've ever cried in my life. In fact, my tear ducts are just about run dry. But I cried, and I, I just stopped. I, I said, oh, this is a beautiful place. And I cried and carried on. Oh, it's such a beautiful, beautiful place. Well, behind me was my son, Tony, who just brought me to the platform. And behind him was his little daughter, Tanil, who calls me Papa. A little bitty short red-headed thing. Hair's never been cut, I don't think, way down her back. And she never seen Papa like that. She just watched every move I made. I walked into the den. I stopped again. I said, wait a minute, Jerry, don't go any further. I cried. I've heard people say that when they got saved, that the sky looked bluer and the trees looked greener. And everything seemed to be more vivid. It didn't happen to me when I got saved that way. 
When I walked into the house that night, everything did just seem to look better. Even the lines in the wall, people looked more vivid to me, and I cried, and I said, God's given us such a wonderful place to live. God's been so good. I said, we take it for granted. I walked down the hall, looked in the bathroom, I said, oh, I was crying. It's the cleanest bathroom I've ever seen in my whole life. <laughs> it looked like a garden from one of the house to the other. The next morning, my son lives in a three-room house out in the country. Three rooms. Three rooms. As my daddy used to say, the rooms are not big enough to cuss a cat without getting her hair in your mouth. You're probably right about that. <laughs> and they got, got two little girls. And Tony said they were dirty underwear piled up, and they got a little hall about that long. You can lay down and touch both ends of the hall with your toes and feet. Uh, dirty underwear were laying all in the floor of the hall, and it's a big sack of clothes had been washed and not folded and laying over there. The toilet hadn't been flushed, and the little potty hadn't been emptied. My little daughter, granddaughter, Tennille, who'd watched me the night before when I went to the house, got up early in the morning. Her mother had not seen what I had done the night before at home. Little Tennille, with her hair strangling down and a little gown on, reached out and began to hold the wall so the hand went down the hall like this, said, Oh, God, he's given us such a beautiful place to live in. Oh, God, what a beautiful home he's given us to live in. She looked in that bathroom where the toilet hadn't been flushed and the potty hadn't been said, Oh, God, what a clean bathroom, what a clean... Her mother's eyes got about that big. She said, Tony, something's wrong with Neil. Something's wrong with Neil. <laughs> you know what was going on with Neil. <laughs> but I thought that's the funniest thing. Kids mimic what you say, you know. Well, after all this singing, I shouldn't do this. But Donna, come to the piano and let me sing something, too. <laughs> you don't mind a little country singing, you know. There might be a couple of country people in heaven. You can't ever tell. <laughs> there might be some that don't have trained voices, you know. I'm not trying to sing because I think I can sing. I just want to sing. <laughs> Once I wandered out in sin had no peace, no joy within, and my soul was burdened down with pride. But the Savior came along and he showed me I was wrong, and he placed me on the wind. Oh. 
You come to a place like this, you have such an unusual desire to say just the right thing and to say it in just the right way with the right spirit. I often wish I could have heard Jesus preach in person, literally. I have his words here. I don't know about his diction, his enunciation, his accent. Now the vibe with which he preached. But I like to have heard him when he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I've gathered you together. I think I know how George Whitfield must have felt when he prayed, Dear Jesus, someday I'll be like thee. And if I'll be like thee someday, why not now? When I can be a blessing to the most people. To have your glorified body now. To think like you'll think then. To be able to express yourself now like you will then. It'll be a glorious and wonderful thing. But God is so deemed that we have these mortal bodies that must die someday, and they get weaker and weaker. And these mortal minds which sometimes lose their train of thought. And I'd like to preach a happy sermon to you. Perhaps you'll find it happy. But I'd rather preach to you what God has put on my heart. And I hope you won't think I'm trying to take too much time tonight. I probably have less time left than most of you that are in this building, if the doctor's right. The second book of uh, Timothy was written to a young preacher by an older preacher. Now, let's pause to say, when I say that, I want, you, I want it understood that these are not the words of Paul, in a sense. These are the words of God. Because every Bible writer wrote down exactly what was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. Nothing less and nothing more. And every Bible writer was not left on his own to choose the words with which to write the revealed truths. As the scripture said in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11, which words we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. The truths are not only spiritually revealed, but the words are spiritually chosen. Not from the vocabulary of the Bible writers. God was not limited to the vocabularies, as some scholars claim. But really, they were words which the Holy Ghost teacheth, not which, not which man's wisdom teacheth. And so when I read this book I hold in my hand, I, I read to you the Word of God. But this last letter to Timothy was Paul's last among 14 letters so written as I've described. A man's last words are usually his most important words. We tend to remember his last words. I have a book entitled uh, The Last Words of Famous Men, and it has to do with men like Moody and Tory and others. And it even has in it some infidels and what they said on their dying beds. You have four chapters here and 83 verses. The whole theme of the book is faithfulness to Christ. Dr. Robertson said once, and it may not be much, but you can be faithful. And he's saying to a young preacher, stay with it. Be faithful. Don't quit. In chapter 2 and verse 2, he said, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. I get the impression when I read these verses, even back in chapter 1, when he talks about the unfeigned love in Timothy that was first in his mother and then in his grandmother, Eunice and Lois. That something had been handed down from grandmother to mother to son. And Paul is saying, the same things commit thou to faithful men. And I'd remind you to circle that little word same in that text. Not something nearly the same, but the same. Not something close to it that you can't hardly tell the difference in it, but the same. We have a great heritage handed down to us. I received a little booklet from Mickey Carter a year ago entitled, Things That Are Different Are Not the Same. It's defense of the King James Bible, a good little booklet, by the way. 
But as I read the book through, I hurriedly looked for the thought, things that are different, not the same, and discovered there's 36 chapters in the book. You only had one chapter on that subject in four pages. Just a little sad about that, but the thought got into my mind. I couldn't get away from it. Things that are different are not the same. The things which I have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou, the same commit thou, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Salvation by grace and salvation by works is not the same. It is different. The most important message, as far as I'm concerned, all the Bible is the clear gospel message. When Jesus gave the Great Commission, he did not leave them on their own to choose their message. But rather, he said in Mark 16, verse 15, Go into into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Just yesterday, I heard a man say on the radio or television that a certain area was gospel-hardened. And I thought to myself, you just don't understand. The area is not gospel-hardened. The area is gospel-ignorant. 137 137 people die every second, so I'm told, and 122 of them die without having heard a clear presentation of the gospel. And not all of them are in foreign lands where there is no printed Bible. Many of them are in our churches on Sunday morning and Sunday night. But we so muddy the gospel that when men want to make a decision to trust Christ, we have made it so complicated that they can't make a simple decision to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. We'll say, if you don't do this or you don't do that or you haven't done that, you're not saved. But the truth of the matter is, when asking the Bible, sirs, what must I do to be saved? One clear, simple answer was given to it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. When Nicodemus asked our Lord, how can a man be born when he's old? He thought he was talking about a a rebirth. He said, how can a man enter the second time his mother's womb and be born? But Jesus was talking about a new birth. He said, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. I'm not talking about another fleshly birth. I'm talking about a spiritual birth, he said, and he gave it very, very clear. In verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Clear, very clear. John 3, 36 divides the whole world into two groups. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he believeth not, the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. It stays on him and stays on him and stays on him forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. You can't add any works to grace. If I were to give my watch to my son and say, Son, I want you to have this watch. I'm giving you this watch. And then say, now, All I ask of you is to cut my grass once a year. It just ceases to be a gift and become a purchase. If as I give you this watch, totally free of charge, except you must come and mow the lawn once every ten years. It just ceases to be a gift and become a purchase. Romans 11, 6, you're going to look at it. It clearly, very clearly says it cannot be any combination of grace and works. It must be one or the other. It says, if by grace and it's no more works, otherwise grace is no more grace. And if by works it is no more grace, otherwise works is no more works. You cannot add any works at all. Here's a situation where it cannot be 999% grace and 1,000% works. The 1,000% destroys the grace altogether. I'm 60 years old, was in July. I had to stand at heaven's gate in the next five minutes. You think I'd hold up my good life to Jesus? To go hold my, I works up to Jesus Christ and say, here, I've done this and I've done that and I've done you all let me into heaven? No. If it was like this, and it won't be this way. But if they said, why should we let you in? I'd say, in my hand, no price I bring. Yeah. Simply to the cross I claim. Yeah. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Yeah. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Yeah. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Things that are different are not the same. You say, well, if you'll do this, man, you do that, and you do the other. No, if you just say, you do one thing and you'll get saved, other than trust Christ, you've gone too far. 
Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Galatians 2, 20 says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if a righteous had come by law, then Christ be dead in vain. He died for nothing. If you had to work to get saved, someone had to discover or determine how much work you had to do and how long you had to do it and what motive was behind it. No wonder old John Newton, having lived a life that could not merit anything like salvation, when he finally got saved, wrote that song that I wish I had written and all you wished you had written. Amazing grace, how sweet this sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the eye first believed. Yeah. Salvation by grace and salvation are by works are not the same. Oh, they may be close. Did you know, so far as I know, Baptists are the only large group of Christians in America that has in their doctrinal statement the fact that we believe in eternal security? Nobody else has it in there. You know what they miss by not having that? They miss joy. They miss peace. They miss a life of service. How can you bury your loved ones and know they've gone to heaven if you think they've got to get a loss somewhere along the way? I'd say, I hope mother's in heaven. I hope my mother's there. I hope she made it. No, when I buried my mother, I said, goodbye, mother. I'll see you again. It wasn't a hope so with me because she had not only life, she had everlasting, eternal life. She couldn't lose it if she tried. Because the base, not upon what she did for Jesus, but upon what Jesus Christ had done for her. She's saved forever. The lifestyle evangelism and soul winning are not the same. You walk across this lot out here, you see a car, it's got a, a tag on it that says Lincoln. You'll pass another car that says Ford. You know why I have different labels on them? Because they're not the same. They're different. That's why they named them different. You can get in that Ford and drive down the expressway and say it rides like a Lincoln, doesn't it? You can't tell the difference between this and my Lincoln, can you? If you tell the truth, you've got to say, yeah, there's a difference. Because things that are different are not the same. And a Lincoln's not a Ford, and a Ford's not a Lincoln. And you walk in this church building, you see a Chevrolet and a Cadillac out there. Or you may see a GMC and something else. If it's got a different name on it, they're not the same. There was a new style evangelism that came out a few years ago. What you do, they say, you, you don't really confront anybody. You might frighten them away. What you do is, uh, is you just leave it before them. Just keep smiling and grinning like Jimmy Carter did for years. <laughs> I'm still wondering what he's grinning at. He's got something hid somewhere nobody knows anything about. They said, you just walk around, live like a Christian, dress like a Christian, be smiling, and, and uh, tell everybody hello, and slap on the back, be friendly. And after a while, they'll get so hungry for what you got, they'll ask you what's wrong with you, or what's different about you, and you can tell them how to get saved eventually. The only thing wrong with that, you won't find it anywhere in your King James Bible. I'm 60 years old. Nobody's ever walked up to me and said to me, you look so much like Jesus, tell me how to get saved. <laughs> Never happened. The closest that ever came to us at the hospital about three days before I got my last radiation treatment, the little nurse that pushed me in and said, you're a very peaceable man. What do you do? I said, you really want to know what I do? She said, you're very peaceful, and what do you do? I said, I tell folks how to go to heaven when they die. That's my life. And since you brought it up, I'd like to tell you. And I told her. And her little friend came in and listened to. That's the only thing that's ever been close to that to me. I've sat on a plane, next to a plane, and a plane. I've sat next to planes, but next to people in planes, too. But I'd rather sit next to planes than on planes. 
Somebody said, you're afraid of flying, no, I'm afraid of crashing. <laughs> Another guy said, well, it's not your time to go, you're not going to go. When your number goes up, you're going to go no matter where you are, you may as well fly. That sounded comforting. I got up on that plane and got the thing, what if that pilot's number comes up, what am I going to do? I'm going on the wrong number. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> when I go on and make dead trips, my number, I want to check it eight times before I leave here. <laughs> There's only one kind of evangelism. Lifestyle evangelism is not so winning. They're different. You know, that's why they call them by different names. <laughs> Things that are different, you know, are not the same. <laughs> They're different. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith cometh by demonstration. <laughs> and demonstration by Godly living. And when you live Godly enough, they'll get thirsty for what you have and ask you how to get it. That'd come out of somebody's Bible other than what I have in my hand up here. I guarantee you that. Right. Now, the Bible I have says, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Yeah. Faith doesn't come by observation. It comes by hearing. And you're not going to lead people to Christ. You open up this book and tell them how to get saved. It works. <laughs> Last week, Carl Hatch in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, approached a nun on the street near Middle Tennessee State University. It had all of her garb on, whatever you call it. It's her habit, I guess. I thought that's something you want to get rid of, a habit. <laughs> Best way to break one's drop it, I suppose. You'll get that tomorrow by freight. The best way to break a habit is drop it. I don't believe I said that. But Carl had to approach his nun and said, Sister, good to see you. He loud. Said, good to see you, sir. He said, I want you to make a deal with me. She said, What is it, sir? So said, I want you to make a straight shot to heaven with me. Just like that. You know, you may not know what he meant by that. None knew what he meant. That meant, let's go to heaven and not stop in purgatory. Because they think they're all going to purgatory because none of them will get up to heaven when they die. They've got to go to purgatory and get purged of all unconfessed venial sins before they move out to heaven. She said, I'd like to do that, sir. And Carl said, I'm going to walk up down the street and you watch how I live here about 15, 20 minutes. Let me show you how to, how to live. I'll demonstrate this to you. You, you could tell in about two minutes he wasn't a soul one if he did that. But he pulled his Bible out and took it to the Word of God. In five minutes' time, she had her head bowed and trusted Jesus Christ as her Savior. And said, I feel so much better on the inside. Oh, I feel so much better on the inside. She didn't know why, but something happened inside her. The Holy Ghost had come in to live in her. That's what it happened. The things which I have heard of me among many witnesses, same. Not something close to it. Old-fashioned sewing is handed down to me. I was taught how to just go and ask a person to die. You know you're going to heaven. If they don't know, show them how from the Bible. Ask them to trust Christ to say It still works. Yeah. Ask Dr. Bowles. If it doesn't still work, it still works. That other stuff's a cop out for somebody who's too lazy to win souls to Christ. If you don't think it works, there's Larry Chapel. They've been to South Biden's his life. Who's here from California? Had how many on visitation last week? 400 on visitation last week. How many visits did they make? 3,500 visits they made last week. You go out there, you'll see the results of that, too, in a church that's growing by leaps and bounds fast. And Bill Billings are filling them up again. Had over a thousand in prayer meeting last Wednesday night. Just a young church just getting started. My friend, Clarence Sexton, preached there for him. I'm telling you, you just stick with the book. You can't beat this book. Why does every generation feel that we've got to change it just a little bit because our daddy did it fast for us and our granddaddy did it like that? And let's change it just a little bit. You change it and things that are different are not the same. The same commit thou to faithful men. I don't make you mad tonight, but this is a Bible my, my granddaddy used. It's about my great granddaddy used. It's about my great great granddaddy used. It's about my great 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 that granddaddy used. It's the Bible Spurgeon used. It's the Bible they used for 300 years since 1611 till the turn of the century. 
And somebody said, well, it's, you know, we can improve it a little bit. And since then, we had a hundred different English translations printed since the turn of the century. Don't get to go, don't, don't bow your head. I ain't ready to pray yet. I'll, t- I'll tell you when to bow your head. Just look at me. I was in an office, IV in my arm. A doctor friend of mine brought in a preacher friend of his. I was kindly a captive audience. I couldn't go anywhere. So he decided to preach to me a while about science. He quoted John 3:36, and he said, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he quoted the latter part of the verse, He that obeyeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. I didn't go on with long spiel and long spiel about you had to obey Christ to get saved and finish the whole thing. And I said to him, well, when you quoted John 3.36, while well, God said you quoted the American Standard Version, the reason I know is what Tory used. And I read a lot of Tory sermons. But I said you have a contradiction in verse 36. In the first part it says you're saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. In the latter part it says if you don't obey Christ, the wrath of God abides on you. Now, there's an inconsistency there. I didn't yell at him like I'm yelling at you. He was in an office. I slapped him. In Christian love, but hard. <laughs> then I said to him, hey, exactly what degree of obedience is necessary for the wrath of God not to abide on you? And the preacher who was back into the corner said, absolute obedience. I said, in that case, I'm not saved. I don't have a friend that's saved. Don't know anybody in the world that's saved. Doubt if you're saved. How many here... Never disobeyed God one time in your life. Raise your hand and get a picture. I won't put in the sword of the Lord folks to meet you. <laughs> Who's never disobeyed God since you've been saved? Raise your hand. How many think you may have disobeyed Him at least one time since you've been saved? Raise your hand. John Reynolds raised both of them. <laughs> you see, you go to monkeying with the Bible and you change the most important message in the whole book with one verse. Don't get mad at me now. But if God used this book and great revivals with Billy Sunday, with D.L. Moody, built great churches like the Tabernacle in London, why do we want to be monkeying around changing everything in it all the time? I'm going to tell you why you like to change it, and you don't like it, but I'm going to tell you how. James chapter 1 says, He that's a hearer of the word, not a doer, is like a man beholding his natural face in the glass and walk away and forget what he looks like. The Bible's a mirror. And when you look into the mirror, you don't like what you see in the mirror. So rather than change a man, you change a mirror. If you're fat, you get one of the mirrors that makes you look skinny. If you're skinny, you get your mirror that makes you look fat. No, just keep the same old mirror and change a man's looking in the mirror. I don't want to get on all the versions. I'm just telling you, I like this one. Been around 300 years before it had a competitor. I like it. I'll die with it. If anybody in my funeral quotes out of another, I'm getting out of the casket. I say, hold it, buddy. You got the wrong version in this place. Things that are different are not the same, you know. That's why they call it the New King James. That's why they call it the Living Bible. That's why they call it the Revised Standard Version. That's why they call it the New International Version. They got different names because they're not the same. But the things which I have heard of me, the same, 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 commit thou to faith for me. Hello. As my son Tony says when he makes his congregation mad, I'm just glad to be here. Evangelicalism and fundamentalism is not the same. When you rename it and call it evangelical fundamentalism, leave me out of it. You change it then. The thing that concerns me now is so many young preacher boys who go off to college and they don't even have a good class on contemporary theology. Because some preachers get up and, and push evangelicalism and fundamentalism the same expression, try to make it one the same because they don't understand it. A lot of young preachers think it is the same. There's a big, big difference. 
Old evangelicalism based on a theology of fundamentalism was supplanted by new evangelicalism. Based on the theology of infiltration rather than separation, as the Bible clearly declared we ought to do. Don't look up. I ain't ready to pray yet. If you just think the five fundamentals constitutes the fundamentalist, and you got you got somebody on your side there you don't want over there, you got Jimmy Swaggart next to you. He believes the five fundamentals. You got Graham on the other side. Come on, don't get quiet on me now. You got old Roberts behind you. They all believe that. You got the Pope in front of you. He believes all that too. That's my boy. He's learning. I had to pay him $10 to get that, but he's learning. I thought I'd never get it. He... I got two more coming before I finish this sermon. Dr. Rice was a member of the NAE, the National Association of Evangelicals. Bob Jones College was the first one to join it. There's a first one to come out of it, too. Say amen again. When they started ecumenical evangelism, yoked up with unbelievers, started calling Mormons Christians and Catholics Christian brothers. They said, goodbye, we'll see you all later. You're not our crowd anymore. You've got a different name now, and things that are different are not the same. You don't call yourself fundamentalists. You see, we not only believe the fundamentals of faith, we believe in ecclesiastical separation. You don't, yeah. you don't yoke up with somebody that's not saved and call him a Christian brother. You don't have him on your platform, pray him as a Christian brother, make everybody out there think the guy's all right and hope he's a hero. You don't do that. That's why I'm not a Mormon. I'm not a Methodist. I'm not a Presbyterian. I'm not mad at everybody in the world that's not a Baptist, but I'm a Baptist. I like my name, but didn't I change it? Fundamentalism believes in not joking up with unbelievers. They say the end never justifies the means. It's never wrong, right to do wrong to get a chance to do right. But look at all the people saved. Well, suppose I said, look at here. I mean, you could go rob the bank tomorrow. Nobody ever suspect us. We're preachers. We could rob the bank and get about a million dollars. We could put the gospel in all the major newspapers in the world. Probably get, probably get uh, 20,000, 30,000 people saved both Sunday and tomorrow night. So we go rob the bank. You think we did the right thing? Well, we got 10,000 saved. We got 10,000 saved. I said, shut up. Wake up. Come on, wake up. Well, you said, we shouldn't have stole the money. I know. That's the point I'm making. It's never right to do wrong to get a chance to do right. And the end never justifies the means. Wrong is wrong and right is right. Do right. Until the stars fall. The same commit out of faith for me. Not something close to it. Same thing. Southern Baptist Convention and Independence are not the same. That's why I'm an independent Baptist. Oh, Oliver Green said he was so independent that the termites and, and his church wouldn't fellowship with the termites in the church down the street. Don't think I'll be that independent, maybe, but we are independent. I prayed for the conservatives in the convention. I've talked with them. I've talked with them on the phone, some of them. They called me. I said, I hope you can change the convention. I pray you will. They said, we think we've got a program to do it. I said, I'll pray for you. But to be honest with you, I don't think you'll ever change it. I'll tell you why. We're the salt of the earth. Salt is never antiseptic, but aseptic. Salt does not heal anything. It only prevents the spread of corruption. You put salt on a rotten piece of meat, it won't come back fresh. You may put it on a piece of fresh meat, it may not rot if you put enough salt on it to keep from rotting. But what's rotten is rotten. It ain't coming back. I said, what's rotten is rotten. It ain't coming back. There ain't enough salt in the world to bring it back. It's gone. And it also bothers me when somebody says, well, the independence just as rotten as the Southern Baptist Convention. I say to myself, you don't know much about independent Baptists. I challenge you to go to any independent Baptist school and find one liberal professor on the campus that the president of the school knows about. 
My friend David Boulder is uh, head of Tennessee Temple University. If he knew he had a man there that did not believe the Bible's Word of God, he'd be gone for Sunday and tomorrow night. If he didn't, I'd kill David in Christian love. <laughs> Until God, he died with the chicken pox. <laughs> Clarence Sexton, Crown Bible College. You go, you find one person on that campus that denies the virgin birth of Christ, and, I, and I'll never speak at Crown College again as long as I live. You won't find one. Well, they're going to change it. I said, all right, I'll pray you'll change it. But I'm going to tell you something. We're the salt of the earth, and salt never cures corruption. only prevents the spread of it. All you do is hope to stem the tide. Can it get any worse? Have they improved it any? Well, you, change, you, you decide. For 15 years, they've elected their own hand-picked president every year. This year in Orlando, Florida, they carried their hand-picked candidate down there. But when he was nominated, to their surprise, they elected a moderate candidate. Jim Henry, pastor of First Baptist Church in Orlando. Hello. You don't think he's moderate? Talk to my son-in-law. He pastors in the same city. He's on the front row. Ask him. In fact, he asked my son-in-law, would your dad-in-law preach for me? He said, I don't think so. <laughs> I can tell him now. I know I wouldn't. He, will, he won't take a stand on homosexuality. Won't take a stand on abortion. Fifteen years, conservative president. Now they got a president. Won't take a stand on abortion, homosexuality, either one. Hang on. In his first statement, I read in the paper after he was elected, said he wanted to reach out to the disaffected moderates. You know what a moderate is? That's a liberal. That's the guy. Don't believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired, infallible word of God. Oh, they say in matters of doctrine and spiritual matters, it's correct. But scientifically, it is not correct. And historically, it is not correct. And you're incorrect, sir. Sit down. The Bible has never been proven to be scientifically or historically incorrect. It is correct in everything it has to say. It's the Word of God. It's infallible. Medical science used to think you'd heal people by bleeding them. My daddy was a barber, and on the front of a barber shop is a, is a pole that has red and white on it, like a, pigment, a stick of candy. You ever seen that in front of a barber shop? I said, Daddy, what's that pole for? He said, Well, son, you won't bleed, but the red's for the blood and the white's for the bandage. I said, They used to cut people that bad? Well, he said, No, let me finish. <laughs> he said, Barbers used to bleed people. They had a sharp razor there. They'd bleed people. If people got sick, they'd bleed them, take some blood out, thought to make them well. I have read they bled George Washington to death. I don't know whether it's true or not. Medical science, so-called. When's the last time you saw them bleeding in about the hospital? Now they've learned the Bible's right all along. They're getting blood transfusions now. Because the Bible said in the book of 1711, the life of the flesh is in the blood. They're draining the life out of them. Now they're putting it back in them. I know. I'm on, I'm on somebody's blood up here tonight. I got three pints before I came here. I love it, tomato juice, as long as it's pure. I don't get it out of the bank up there. If I don't get somebody that's living right and some godly Christian to give it, I say, keep it. You can have it. I'm just glad to be here. Well, I'm on the winning side. Yes, I'm on the winning side. No more hiding sin will I abide. I've enlisted in the fight for the cause of truth and right. Praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. You see, our crowd's not very big. It's big enough. It's as big as God wants it. It didn't be bigger. Why you, he re- why you reckon he wrote in the Bible, narrow is the way, and straight is the gate, and few there be that find it. And why you reckon he wrote in the Bible, broad is the way, and wide is the way it leads to destruction, and many. I'm not looking for the crowd. I'm looking for what's right. I love it. I love the old Bible, the precious old Bible, the light on my pathway does shine. It keeps me so sweetly, ever so sweetly, God's wonderful book divine. I love it. Hug it. 
things are different, not the same. I don't know how much time I got left. I may live 20 more years. I hope so. I'll go back and see that doctor 20 years from now. Told me three and a half years ago, you know what you got is a slow, torturous death. I said, he said, you're a terminal. I said, you're a terminal too. You think you're going to live forever? I said, life's terminal. It's the point a man wants to die. You may get out of here before I do. If I have my way, you will. One lady said to a friend, I've been seeing spots. Just a bunch of spots. One of mine said, have you seen the doctor? I said, no, just spots. So far, just spots. <laughs> she's a lot better off looking at spots than she's a doctor. <laughs> I'm not mad at doctors. That woman in the Bible said she spent all she had on physicians. And was none the better. That describes a lot of them, don't it? <laughs> but rather grew worse. That's why I felt when I left that hospital. I said, go to God, I fulfill that passage today. And all I had on physicians, and none the better, but rather grew worse. Can't even walk when I left here. Not mad at doctors. I may need one for the night so far, but if I do, find me one that's got some sense, if you can. Find me a Christian, if you can find a Christian. The things which I have seen and heard of me, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. I'm going to stick with what I got. It's an expression I might already use, but the cowboys used to say, dance with the one that brung you. And I'm going to dance with the one that brung me. I'm sticking my Bible, land of the Baptist heritage. Soul winning, not lifestyle evangelism. Salvation by grace, free gift, all you do is receive it. That's what I'm sticking with. If I got a year, a hundred years. Let's have a pianist come and play that old song. There's a fountain filled with blood. Is that what I'm hunting, Tony? Is that it? Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm hunting. That's it. Who's a pianist here? Can anybody? Here she comes. Give me a songbook, somebody.